been an area of overall technology that has been advancing rapidly. And Cisco is certainly a major player in the game of wireless now, thanks to their own internal developments and a series of strategic acquisitions. We want to have a good taste for the wireless game, and we want to really have a foundation for wireless design that could allow us to succeed immediately if we decided to specialize in Cisco's wireless track. By the way, when we talk about wireless, I mentioned this before in the course, we're talking about maybe mobile wireless with like 3G technology where we can send data via mobile phones at up to a two megabit per second speed, or we're referring to wireless local area networking technology, which is going to be our focus in this course, or maybe we're talking about just setting up two antennas on two different buildings that are pointing Wi-Fi signals at each other in order to bridge those lands together. We can typically get up around, oh, 40 megabits per second with technology like this in a pure point-to-point -point fashion. But remember, the focus for you as a CCDA is definitely going to be in wireless local area networks, where we go in and rip out the physical layer one physical wiring and the layer two transport technologies, and we replace those with wireless. The beauty of this invention is the fact that the upper layer protocols like TCP IP, that's of course the transmission control protocol, internet protocol, and even like UDP, these particular protocols aren't necessarily affected. I say they're not necessarily affected because certainly we can run into issues with wireless, like interference, obstructions. These are issues we're certainly not used to dealing with and that we don't have to deal with in traditional wired environments. So we are going to have a whole new set of concerns when we move to wireless lands. By the way, there are a lot of similarities to the legacy ethernet that we focused on in this course like MAC addresses used for layer two addressing, and the wireless LAN access point, it's acting like a hub. Ugh, ugh, wait a minute here. Huh. It's not acting like one of our fancy layer two switches? No, it's not. No, it's not. It is acting like a hub. That means we're going to have a half duplex a relatively inefficient communications method between these protocols. Yes, we are going to have one big collision domain. Yes, we are going to have a situation where collisions can indeed occur. In the wireless lands, collisions can't be detected like they are in those Ethernet environments. And it's because the, the stations can't listen and send. So when 802.11 technologies, there is a reliance on carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. Stations in the wireless LAN attempt to avoid collisions before they could ever happen by using something called a distributed coordination function, and this utilizes random backoff timers. The AP is the traffic cop. The access point sees someone send and sees that it was successful, and then the access point acknowledges the success of that transmission. A concept that you need to be intimately familiar with for CCDA is the concept of the service set identifier, the SSID. This is the concept in the wireless LAN of the identifier for the logical wireless LAN. In other words, if you have two devices that are in different SSIDs, they'll ignore each other's traffic. But please note, this doesn't affect the collision domain. 
one of the biggest misconceptions that I find out there about wireless local area networking is the fact that everyone thinks that these SSID cells, or not cells of that word, let me back up, these SSID logical structures, that they're like collision domains, that they're creating separate collision domains. No, 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 that's not the case, okay? Everyone within signal of each other is in the same collision and broadcast domains. It's just that service set identifiers will cause the different stations to ignore the frames that they're getting from the different SSIDs. Wow, really, really interesting concept. When it comes to these SSIDs, we can build the infrastructure into two overall modes over three different categories. The three different categories you need to be aware of are the independent basic service set. This almost never happens anymore. This is called ad hoc mode, where wireless clients just use Wi-Fi capability to exchange data over the air without the use of any access point. Again, rare that we'd set up a wireless LAN in this ad hoc mode. What is much more common is the use of a basic service set, SS approach. With the basic service set approach, we have an access point. By the way, this is also called wireless infrastructure mode. The access point is helping to act as that traffic comm like we described. Another capability is to do an extended service set, and this is where we have multiple access points that are servicing the same service set identifier. This is nice because when we organize in an extended service set, we can have individuals covering a larger distance with their wireless devices and it's all transparent and seamless. So they can just move from AP to AP, keeping the same service set identifier. And I'll elaborate for this, uh, this, I'll elaborate on this for you later on when we go ahead and we discuss roaming. Now there's this process that a device goes through in order to get on the Wi-Fi network in infrastructure mode it needs to do what's called associate with its access point. The client device will send a probe request out on the network in order to find this access point. The access point will send a probe response. The client will initiate the association, and then the access point will either accept or reject that association. If it's successful, the access point will install the MAC address of the client. Notice this is a lot like a DHCP kind of handshake. Now, wireless LANs, just like non-broadcast multi-access, NBMA technologies had a lot of different topologies, had a lot of different ways in which we could set those up. Wireless LAN technologies, same thing. In the wireless LAN environment, you can have APs performing bridging type functions where maybe they're accepting traffic from the traditional local area network and they're forwarding out to wireless clients. Maybe they're doing this point to point between buildings like I described, or maybe they're doing it point to multi-point. Access points can function as repeaters, accepting a weakened radio frequency signal and strengthening it and resending it. I just had trouble saying strengthening, didn't I? And uh, so they can act like repeaters or the most sophisticated and most exciting top technology is they can act like mesh devices. Wireless local area network meshing, that is some hot, cool technology right there. That's where the device, the access point, can function as a repeater 
or it can function as a bridge, and it will do this based on the radio frequencies. This is really, really cool, and this is technology that allows designers to take Wi-Fi, to take wireless, and literally, like, cover an entire city. Yeah, there's some cities now in the United States where there's Wi-Fi complementary everywhere. I heard Portland, Oregon was one of these places. I don't know that for a fact, but one of my students pointed out to me that Portland was that way. When you visit the beautiful Portland, Oregon area, and you're anywhere in the city of Portland, there is this mesh of Wi-Fi devices bringing complementary wireless to anyone anywhere in the city. Wow, impressive. So remember, our wireless now can bridge the traditional local area network out to wireless clients. Pretty darn cool. Or our Wi-Fi can bridge it in a point-to-point -point type of situation. Here we can see, imagine like two different buildings, and we have these access points that are acting as bridges to connect two different local area networks together. Maybe it's two buildings that have line of sight to each other. Also, we remember that the devices can act in a repeater type of topology where they are picking up the radio frequency signal and strengthening it out to additional devices. This is an example of the access point that is acting as a repeater. Pretty funny, I have this technology working in my small office home office. Yep, I've got an 802.11n access point and then I've got another 802.11n access point in a separate floor of my home that is acting as a repeater for the same SSID in order to strengthen it to other areas of my home and outside. I love to sit out in the sun and be able to use my wireless devices. In fact, I've had neighbors really far away, farther away than I ever would have imagined, say, hey, I saw your guest network. You mind if I hop on and I tell them, yep, that's what my guest network is for. Go for it. So pretty funny um, how you can get pretty sophisticated with this technology, even in the small office, home office environment. But by all means, the most exciting technology when it comes to Cisco Wireless is the mesh technologies. Again, the access points acting like bridges and repeaters as needed to just give amazing coverage areas. It might be a hotel building. It might be a park in a central city. It might be a city itself, an entire city itself that is covered by these wireless mesh devices. Something else that you need to be aware of for CCDA uh, you know, certification is the fact that now enterprise APs, and these typically go by the Aeronet label, keep in mind that if you see Linksys anywhere on the device, this device is go off its home device. But if you see Aeronet on the device, it's a Cisco device that's designed for enterprise usage. One of the awesome things now about these enterprise APs is they can support, obviously, multiple service set identifiers per access point, and then you can turn around and you can map these to VLANs. Wow. In fact, that mapping can take place automatically based on the security settings. In other words, you can have an SSID named guest that has no security, and when they come in that way, they automatically get mapped to VLAN 10. And then you can have an SSID called private, for example, that uses WPA2 security, and that can automatically be mapped to a VLAN 20. 
what you do is you then trunk these VLANs using 802.1Q back to the local area network. And you have just done remarkable things from the aspect of your wireless LANs like usability, right? Guests go into their own special VLAN and get guest resource access. Corporate employees go into their own special VLAN and they get corporate access to the network. Wow. So once again, very important concept and you would probably see this in Cisco certification. We now have the ability to do multiple SSIDs on the APs. They're mapped to VLANs, those SSIDs, and then the VLANs are trunked back via 802.1Q to the LAN. I've got this depicted for you, and notice across the different access points, there's this automatic mapping of devices based on how they authenticated to SSIDs, and then there's a mapping of SSIDs to VLANs that are trunked back to the traditional local area network. All right, now you ready for another hugely important wireless concept? The concept is of standalone versus lightweight access points. Now what's really hugely deceptive about this is the concept that standalone sounds like it would be awesome, right? And lightweight sounds like it would be lame, but it's just the opposite of that. Standalone access points, okay, also known as autonomous access points, they're, they're great, okay, they're great, but they're not as, as they're not as desirable for us as these lightweight access points are from Cisco because we have to go and we have to manage them individually. You've got to connect to them individually and you've got to manually configure things on an AP by AP basis like the SSID, the VLAN information, the security settings. The Cisco Unified Wireless Solution introduces what are called lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers. And they divide up the responsibilities of the control plane. This is technology that Cisco calls split MAC. Again, very important you know this for CCDA certification. So the control plane duties and the data plane duties, they're separated as part of this split MAC concept between your lightweight access point and your wireless LAN controller. To elaborate on this further, the lightweight access point can really just focus on the actual radio frequency transmissions, the real-time operations it needs to handle, like beaconing, probing, buffering. And the wireless LAN controller can go ahead and take care of all the non-real-time stuff, like SSID management, VLAN management, the associations with the access points, the authentication, the wireless quality of service. How oh, cool. So, autonomous access points, bad. Lightweight access points, good. And again, that lightweight, I don't like to be a lightweight, especially when I'm in a pub drinking, but lightweight in this particular case is a good thing. So lightweight access points work in conjunction with these wireless LAN controllers 
in order to split the duties. And by the way, the wireless LAN controllers, as you might guess, make it very easy for you as the manager of the network potentially to manage your network. So we as network designers want to consider these wireless LAN controllers in order to really make it easy on the implementers of the network. Notice that when it comes to your lightweight access point communicating with the wireless LAN controller, notice that all of the radio frequency, frequency traffic that the lightweight access point receives, it has to first go to the wireless LAN controller. So, this really changes how the traditional wireless communications are going to work. There's a protocol called the Lightweight Access Point Protocol, LWAPP, that handles these communications of the radio frequencies between the WLC, the wireless LAN controller, and the lightweight access point. The lightweight access point tunnel can be in a layer two mode where you got to have your access point and your LAN controller in the same VLAN, or you can operate in layer three mode where the wireless LAN controller can be in any other VLAN as long as it's reachable from the access point. Okay, the last concept that I want to talk to you about when it comes to Cisco Wireless is the concept of roaming and mobility. A nice feature that these devices provide is the ability of users to roam, to roam around and go from access point to access point and to not lose any connectivity whatsoever. How exciting. So there's two, uh, three, excuse me, three different types of roaming I want you to be aware of. There's intra-controller roaming. Very, very simple. The individual moves from location to location and they hit access points that are controlled by the very same wireless LAN controller. Not a big deal for Cisco to pull off from a technology standpoint, right? They did move from AP to AP, but both of those APs were controlled by the same wireless LAN controller. It's okay. Now what gets a little tougher is what's called layer two intercontroller roaming. The individual moved from AP to AP and they move from wireless LAN controller to wireless LAN controller. But they stayed within the same subnet. Not as difficult for Cisco to pull off. The most difficult technology for Cisco and implementers to pull off is if they're going to feature layer three intercontroller roaming. What happens here is the individual moves from AP to AP. They have also gone from wireless LAN controller to wireless LAN controller, and they have also gone from one subnet to another. Wow. It's possible to design this and for Cisco to pull it off with their equipment, this layer three intercontroller roaming, but it is very, very complex. One of the things that's going on here is obviously the wireless LAN controllers need to be in close communication with each other now about this individual that has just made this leap in the infrastructure. What's amazing is, and by the way, you can configure what's called mobility groups to make this work. What's amazing about this is the person that did the roaming they keep their same IP address. Wow. So even though they went from AP to AP, from wireless LAN controller to wireless LAN controller, and from one subnet to another, 
they've gotten to maintain their original IP address. Very, very cool. All right. Well, that wraps up our discussion of Cisco wireless technologies. It wraps up for now the CCDA course, at least these portion of live lectures. Like I say, one of the nice things about this electronic distribution of media is that should we want to add appendixes or whatever to this course, we can do so. But that is the official CCDA materials I wanted to present to you. Let's wrap it all up with one final exam review. And this exam review is something that I would want you to be able to do coming out of this course. And for the area of wireless, I'm going to ask you to describe the lightweight access point protocol. Uh, wait a minute. Actually, I've got one too many P's in there. We're not talking about the lightweight access point protocol here. Describe lightweight access points split MAC behavior. There is something called the lightweight access point protocol. We're not talking about that here. What I'm asking you here is, can you describe to me the split MAC concept of a lightweight access point? What's going on with this split MAC concept? Yeah, we can do that, can't we? This concept says, okay, there's going to be this sharing of functionality. There's some device out there on the network, and this particular device is a Wi-Fi device, and it wants to get on our wireless network and you know experience all these great services that our network has to provide. There's gonna be two devices at work here a wireless LAN controller and the traditional, I'll draw it with a couple of antennas, lightweight access point. I shouldn't say traditional, the lightweight access point is a fancy new technology from Cisco. The split MAC operation simply refers to this providing the data plane and this providing the control plane. The lightweight access point is doing your real-time stuff, and the wireless LAN controller, it's helping out with the things like service set identifier management, VLAN management. It'll help out initially with the authentication and association process. And it allows the lightweight access point to do the stuff it does best, and that's like dealing with the RF traffic itself. So, split map operation under Cisco Wireless, yeah, it refers to these fancy lightweight access points that are relying on some brains of the operation, the wireless LAN controller, in order to assist with the wireless 